HMIA means Hunter Moving Image Alliance. Tonight's gonna to be dedicated to the epic film, Symbiopsychotaxiplasm is known as one of the most daring films of its time. Uh, we will be discussing the work with Sue Friedrich and Louise Archambault Greaves. Um, I will just say that HMIA is a collaborative forum for viewing and discussing video and film-based art. This is a regular series of events occurring mostly on Wednesdays. It will continue throughout the spring semester. We are cu currently organized by students and faculty, Anthony Hawley, A.K. Burns, Daniel Boschkov, Anna Sophie Jesperson, Lola Dai, Leah Zalacroy, and me. Um, the first 30 minutes are gonna be a conversation uh, with Sue and Louise, and then the last 30 minutes will be an open Q&A. Um, you could put your name in the chat if we will have a chat or just wave, just let us know that you have a question and it would be the best if you ask your own question. Um, I will very glad, um, it's a huge respect for me to introduce the guests of today. Uh, Louise Archambault Greaves worked alongside her husband, independent filmmaker, William Greaves on the production and distribution of many of his award-winning documentary films, including the acclaimed bi biographies, Ida B. Wells, a Passion for Justice, and Ralph Bunch, and American Odyssey. Since his passing in 2014, she had continued to pro promote and distribute his work and had been actively involved in archiving and presenting the record of six, six decades of his work, including films, audiovisual materials, documents, and papers. A major portion of this extensive collection is now at the Schoenberg Center of Research in Black Culture in the New York Public Library, where it is in the process of being cataloged and will be made available for the public. More recently, she had been working with the award-winning filmmaker, Sue Friedrich, our other guest, on the design and construction of a comprehensive website where Greaves's work can now be viewed. A 400 page book, William Greaves, Filmmaking with a Mission, edited by Scott McDonald and Jacqueline Stewart and published by Columbia University will come out in spring 2021. Sue Friedrich, which- I'm back, sorry about that. <laughs> well, that's fine, I guess, you know, your own, your own bio. Um, <laughs> is um, Sufrit is, is an artist and filmmaker who produced and directed 24 films and videos, including I Cannot Tell You How I Feel, Gut Revolution, From the Ground Up, The Odds of Recovery, Hide and Seek, Sink or Swim, Damn If You're Not, If, if You Don't, The Ties That Bind, and Gently Down the Stream. Friedrich's films have won many awards, including Grand Prix, at the Melbourne Film Festival, Best Narrative Film at the Athens Film Festival, Outstanding Documentary Feature at Outfest, the Golden Gate Award at the San Francisco Film Festival, and Best Experimental Narrative at the Atlanta Film Festival. Her work has been the subject of retrospectives in the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Rotterdam International Film Festival, the Stad Kino in Vienna, the National uh, Film Theater in London, the Buenos Aires Festival of Independent Cinema, the first Tokyo Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, the Cork Film Festival in Ireland, and the Anthology Film Archives in New York. Fritter has received the Alfred Award in the Arts, Fellowship from Rockefeller Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation at the NEA, grants from ITVS and the DAAD, in Berlin and multiple grants from NYSCA, the New York Foundation for the Arts and the Jerome Foundation. Frederick has been teaching film and video production at Princeton University since 1999. So I will start with questions that we have formed as the group. So as the HMIA group, um, it's very important for me to say that we have worked on these together. Um, but beforehand, I would love for Louise to introduce Greaves' work in the, and give us some context about his 
really expensive and absolutely unique um, body of work and really such a long career, such a long and rich and acknowledged career. It, yes, um, it is a long career. And, and I have to start by saying that when I met Bill, I had really no plans whatsoever to be involved with film production. Um, but as I <laughs> tell myself and anyone else who might be interested, you get if you marry a film independent film producer, you're probably going to be dragged into it one way or the other, whether you want it or not. And frankly, um, it's been a wonderful experience that I wouldn't have wanted to miss, but I didn't really know what I was getting into. And um, I'm here tonight without the slightest background in terms of uh, academics and academic training. It's all sort of hands-on. Um, I don't know. So any theory question should be addressed to Sue, <laughs> not to me. Um, and even on a practical basis, we're talking about largely film production as opposed to what is happening today. So I'm a bit out of the, the loop. But um, what I would be able to and hope to is to help you understand where Symbio fits into Bill's total body of work. Although he was already had several careers going, he was only six years older than I when we first met, but um, he had already had a career in the theater as an actor. He had already had a fairly successful career as a songwriter on, in New York. And um, he, had a, oh, and as a daf, uh, dancer professionally. <laughs> so his leap into film production was, I think, a shock to a lot of people. Why, why did he go? There was no one. And no African American filmmakers, per se, at that point in time, there had been a long history of separate cinema. But Bill was thinking in terms of reaching a wider audience. He was not, he came in just as the civil rights movement was taking place, and he was thinking worldwide. <laughs> not just even American, but um, in terms of reaching humanity, <laughs> the human race. <laughs> so um, it was a, a really a, a big step in terms of African-American um, film production that he was taking. I was totally oblivious to all of this, of course, um, but um, when we moved to New York, I, uh, I learned a few things. <laughs> and I'm still learning about my husband. I'm still discovering my husband. I've been um, working, as I said in my little spiel there, the, been working on uh, preserving his work and making sure that it it's, remains a available, hopefully, to uh, another generation of filmmakers and documentarians. I could talk all night about that, <laughs> but I'm gonna stop right here if you have some questions. Um, I guess the only thing would be that uh, you're saying that Symbio was, you were trying to put Symbio in context and his. Yes, thank you for reminding me because that's where I started, right? Um, by the time Symbio came along, um, he had done some very interesting work in, in terms of, I'm thinking in particular of uh, 
a film called Stella Brother, which he had made for um, NET at the time. There was no WNET, it was NET. Um, and it was nominated for an Emmy, it didn't win, but it was a breakthrough film. Has anyone seen that particular film? Still a brother. It's not easily available. Um, it's, it's available but, on our website. Ah, ah, thank so you, Sue. Maybe we should, we should at some point take a moment to point out to people about the website. So okay. anyway, it's carry on. Yeah. Great, great idea. I didn't realize that it was available. Okay. You did such a fantastic job. I'm still discovering it. I'm still discovering this incredible uh, website that Sue <laughs> pushed me into doing. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. <laughs> I really appreciate that you did with this. And everybody that looks at it is kind of blown away. Um, so about Simeo, yeah, it was, can I talk about how my response to, to the whole thing was, I was at home at minding my own business as a normal housewife and a mother of two little children and um, not that involved at that point with my husband's work but um, except for answering the phone <laughs> and typing scripts <laughs> baby in, in lap on my lap um, but I, I trusted this man's judgment, but I was totally, totally um, mystified, is, I think is, it's a kind word to use for it, by what he was really uh, attempting to do. I, I'm still discovering um, how this fits into his, his view of the world and of himself as a filmmaker. And as a, as a wannabe actress, I had been exposed to Bill's um, work with actors in Canada, where we met in 1970, 57. Um, and so I thought of it in terms of, of an acting experiment and a, a discovery of um, the creative process involved in, in um, assuming roles, playing roles. Um, but obviously, in retrospect, and as I'm becoming more sophisticated about these matters, I see that he was exploring a lot of other things with this work. I would actually... It's, hello? Sorry, I'm sorry, Louise. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I would actually really love to expand on this, um, on this thing of, of exploring acting and maybe also Sue can jump in um, at this point because we, we were absolutely obsessed with this thing of both what happens with the actors, but also how yeah. Bill was acting you know, right. uh, in Symbio, like he was the director, but he was absolutely acting. And we also know that he was a professional actor. Um, yeah. And we were totally, you know, blown by what really, what was that kind of acting he was doing? And um, maybe, yeah, maybe you, you too can, can speak of it a little bit. I, I'll do my best. Um, I think, there were several things he was hoping to accomplish with this. And while at the very end, in retrospect, um, he's emphasized his, his theories about creativity and, and, and conflict, a dramatic conflict. Um, <laughs> and he was hoping to capture a moment totally unexpected, uh, new, fresh, if the uh, 
create a moment, a, a, a moment that was totally unscripted and unexpected, spontaneous. Um, but, but um, oh, I've lost track of my thought. I'm so sorry. Um, that was part of the of the goal that he was trying to reach, and I think at times he f even forgot. <laughs> he got more involved with the actor than than the creative aspect of this thing. In fact, I came across what you might be interested in. I, I have a few notes here about that he wrote at the time, they keep referring to this um, concept. Well, the concept exists still in his archive. <laughs> um, and it's never, as far as I know, it's never been published, but it does emphasize the acting aspect of this work. And as an actor and a director, and a teacher of acting, I think that it, I'm, I'm looking for it as I'm talking to, to you. Are we gonna see a secret note <laughs> never published? Yes. That's so exciting. But maybe in the meanwhile, Sue can say something oh. about that because the, this acting thing and this sort of like, you know, there was a written script, but there was so, but it was so not the, the essence of it, right? It was written as if it was like sort of bad on purpose. And we have like a very beautiful question here that goes like, what is written in such a way that allows for, allows for the not written to reveal itself, right? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. I, 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 will, I will repeat that question because I'm, I'm, I was speaking of the acting that was, I was saying that there was a script but the script was more like just the base for other things to come up. It, it had, a, yes. It yeah, had. I mean, such a weird, weird script, absolutely strange. And the, be the beautiful question that I was uh, quoting here is, what is written and what is not or cannot be written? What is written in such a way that allows for the not written to reveal itself? Right, because we have somebody in the film saying, uh, "Life, life is not always beautifully written," <laughs> and that's like fabulous, right? So, this certainly was not beautifully written. In fact, the subject matter had nothing to do with his ultimate goal. Um, I think he just thought this would be something that might <laughs> that might interest to people involved. I don't know. It was new. It was fresh. Nobody had done anything like this. So, okay, try it. But they could have just as well been arguing about, you know, where they're going to go for dinner tonight. It, it, the point was conflict, not the subject of the conflict was not that relevant. And the interesting thing is that he had in his mind that the roles would be reversed, that the male, the man, would eventually attack the woman for being homosexual, <laughs> and that, that she would, they would eventually get together on the basis of mutual problems <laughs> that they want to resolve as you, in, as human beings, you know, no. Wow, nope. I don't think anybody knows that. I don't think we know that as viewers. I, it's, it's lost in this particular uh, version. However, if you looked at two and a half, you might see it evolving in that direction. Has anyone seen two and a half? No, because it's <laughs> not. It's too, uh, Dude, maybe you want to jump, maybe you want to jump in and uh, it, it would be interesting to compare the two um, because two and a half, he works much more intensely or deeply with the actors 
and they get much more uh, complex and involved in a mutual attack. Um, and it's resolved at the end, not completely, not the way he had initially thought it might, but in a way, yes, they get together with this child, this young woman, and sort of take on the role of parenting this, this young man. So it's um, much more in tune with what he had initially thought of in terms of the story. Uh, so Louise, I have a question. Yeah. So, since he shot pretty much everything back then, I mean, he shot more material for two and a half, but the primary material was shot originally with all the different couples and whatever with this idea. Right. Why do you think it was that in take one, he didn't take it up to the point that you're describing? I think he was torn. I, I think the take one may have been the first. It looked to me as if it's the first take. Uh -huh. And I don't know, I think he wasn't yet sure how this was going to work. He tried to get the actors to improvise, but they were not, they did improvise, but not in the direction, maybe they hadn't seen the concept either. Mm. <laughs> it's quite possible that um, this missing concept never got through the actors or they forgot about it. <laughs> and he, he neglected to remind them. He wanted hands off. So it was difficult for him to play this role of hands off and at the same time, direct the actors. I, I think he, it was practically impossible to do both. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, in take two and a half, especially in the um, in the the updated version, which was shot in like two thousand two mm -hmm. or three, um, he 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 focused more intently on on the story, and the dramatic aspects of this the inter the relationship between the two. Uh, actors and as actors and as uh, characters in this little drama. Um, so it's a quite a different take on on uh, on take <laughs> on the takes. <laughs> um, so the, the point I, I should mention is that. Um, this symbio never really took off, as you probably know. Um, nobody could figure it out. The, the story Bill tells, Bill thought it was a work of genius. <laughs> but, and that it would be, you know, it would change <laughs> our whole view of film and acting. Fact, I mean, it is it is a work of genius. I think it's clear. It's clear. And um, yeah. I mean, it's sort of uh, in one of the interviews, he's like, you know, somebody says a film with several layers of reality. What? We never, nobody have thought about that. And it absolutely is a work of genius. And I don't know if I should push another question to the table because this has such a beautiful flow that you know it's like I feel like um, this this sort of flow of the conversation should be respected but maybe we can we can say something about how how this thing was eventually edited oh. so all these foot all these my, miles of film I hear and eventually so there was a plan in advance, but then there was all these things that came up, all these things that the, the crew was shooting, you know, separately uh, behind his back or not behind his back, or we don't know, but <laughs> how, the, how, how could this thing, you know, be summed up into about an hour and a half? Well, obviously 
he decided it he, he initially he thought that each of these takes would be a short film he wasn't thinking of a feature length for each one feature length we don't know <laughs> <laughs> we don't know um he was thinking of, of a short and then he would go to another short, and I think he was going to put it together, and I don't know how, eventually. Um, but your question, could you repeat your question again? Yeah. How was this thing, I mean, we, we imagine so much material, oh. shot three cameras all around, shooting actors, shooting the people, shooting the surroundings, shooting, and then this whole thing somehow was meticulously cut and put very, together. Very to much this, so. To create the work that we know now. Um, so, you know, one, one of the things that occurred to me just recently is that he was working on a newfangled uh, editing machine uh, that came from Germany called the Chem. He was, this, I think, the second <laughs> filmmaker in America to buy a Chem machine. It had three screens. So you could actually look at the same event from three different angles, depending on who, if you had three cameras going simultaneously. And he's never mentioned this to me, but I suspect that it didn't occur to him, because I, I don't know that it had ever been done before. Why are we selecting one as opposed to the other? Let's um, optically, you know, put them all on one screen and let the, the viewer make their decisions about what is happening here, which screen is it that's successful or not, or which one is more interesting? <laughs> How does it come out in the wash? Um, so I think it, it, that, that concept may have come to him right there on the spot as he was looking at the material. But more importantly, when he started working, the edit, on, on the editing and looking at his the footage, by the way, I remember him saying, and not specifically for this film, but for anything he was working on, that he always <laughs> felt that no matter how many films he had made, this one was the first one that he had ever really looked at fresh. It, it had no bearing on what he had done previously. How was, how was the image speaking to him, the one he was actually looking at? You may have had crazy ideas, all kinds of ideas about what you wanted to get, but what did you actually get on film? That determined what you were gonna do with it. <laughs> so scripting for him, you know, was not terribly important. It was what ended up on, on film. Um, so I can only, I remember him, frankly, remember him being very discouraged because he really, he, he had enough money to finish, the, to edit the film. It was, it was money that had been specifically given to the, this take one, not for the whole project, specifically for this. So he had to focus on these actors. And <laughs> I can only imagine how discouraged he must have been when he looked at the footage. He had done, looked at rushes, but to look at it as a total amount of, of footage, what do you do with it? He had a theory that, oh dear, I dropped something over. He had a theory that um, he, about conflict and, and spontaneity and creativity that he would capture 
something great. And he, it didn't happen. It didn't happen until one day, Bob Rosen, who was a production manager, came over to the editing room and said, Bill, I have a, a present for you. And he, he showed him this footage that had been um, already developed, I believe. I'm not sure about that. So Bill said, you know, that saved him. That really saved we him. We were talking about what the crew had filmed yeah. without. Yeah. Yes. 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 That, without that, it would have been another kind of film. I mean, he had to come up with something, <laughs> no matter what it is, whatever it was. But he would have had a really big problem trying to get the story told with what he had available to him. They, much to his surprise, I think, um, the crew is the one that uh, rebelled and that produced the conflict that he was looking for. So um, it didn't come from the actors who were trying very hard to <laughs> please him, <laughs> but the crew <laughs> was on a different wavelength. <laughs> That's um, Louise, I just wanted to say something about uh, the chem, you know, the, so that he was able to see the three screens at the same time. And I think a lot of times with film, there is a certain amount of luck or chance right. that gives you something fantastic that you couldn't have planned on your own. Right. And it might be the way you shot something or whatever it might be. And I've had this experience many times. And I think that's a, a really great example of it because you know, I imagine that Bill would have been perfectly able to think of a split screen you know, if he was working on a flatbed that had a single screen. But the fact that he had the chem and he could see them just made it so, you know, present this this yeah. opportunity. And and also it's so well suited to the film because he has different people playing the same part. He's got, you know, sort of chaos in a certain way. I mean, I think very controlled chaos, but he has all this chaos. And so to have the multiple images on the screen is absolutely you know, fits perfectly with the story that's being told. And it's just, you know, it's fantastic. So that, that was a, a, a revelation. And a, I think, I, I'm, I don't remember him ever mentioning the reason why he put those three, but I have a feeling it was looking at it physically. That said, hmm, they're all bad shots, but they're all interesting in terms of the story that we're trying to tell. Right. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I love the fact that they did that. I don't, Sue, maybe you can tell me, are there any other filmmakers who did anything like that prior to, or do we know of any? You know, I'm, I'm thinking there, like I'm, I'm maybe confusing dates and somebody else who knows more about film history in that sort of particular way could say, but. I'm thinking there are certain moments in some of Godard's early work where there's sort of split screen stuff. You know, I think it was a time when people were starting to experiment with breaking up the narrative visually in, in a certain way. So I can't say, you know, exactly a, another film that did it before that might have been right. a precedent for him. Okay. I think it was sort of in the air, right. um, but he did so well. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it did, I don't know if anyone has heard that Bill actually took this film to um, Paris and showed it to uh, Louis Macarel, who uh, was selecting films for Cannes at the time. Yeah. So Bill thought this was going to, to be something they would love over there, if not here. <laughs> and he found out it, they had, he had dinner with Louis and Marcarelle and they said, Louis, I really couldn't make head nor tail of it. <laughs> so Bill found out later when the film came back to New York, it's, that all the reels had been mislabeled. 
So poor, poor Louis had looked at it. <laughs> Not only was this a complicated story with many levels of reality, but, but the films, the reels had been rushed through the lab and had been mislabeled. Yeah, that's, that's a crazy story. Friends, I uh, must open this to questions and answers to Q&A. We don't have a chat, so I suggest that we just try to be very uh, mindful of each other and sensitive, and you can just, you can just try to ask your question, but, but please, uh, please let's just mind each other. And if somebody starts to speak or, you know, we just, we just need to share this space uh, uh, gen yeah, gently. I'm game. <laughs> Who's going to be the first? So, question. Hey, yeah, question from Bradley. Hmm. No, no, no. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, no, I have, I have a question because I know that. Uh, what is it? Sorry. You can say. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that he was in. Can you see the face? So, I know that he was in New York during the time that the radical theater, people like the living theater and the open theater were working. And I was curious if that kind of, you know, kind of anti authoritarian, anti hierarchical thing that's also kind of the structure of his work, but whether those theater groups, you know, were doing very a lot of radical things. Uh, was an influence on him in some ways. I doubt it, um, but I can't be a, a give you a definite answer. Um, but why uh, uh, Gordon, uh, what's his name? The, the sound man, Gordon somebody. Does anybody remember his name? <laughs> um, was a member of the, of the Living Theater, I believe. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. So they sound like they had had exposure to the, the crew itself. Uh -huh. um, but as far as Bill was concerned, I don't think so. I, I'm not aware of any connection at all. Because because the other thing that I was thinking was also Shirley Clark's film, oh. you know, of the connection, which it has a kind of a film about a play about a play. It has this kind of inner structure that's similar to, to Symbio. In a sense, what, and, you know, what, what year would that have been? Well, it was made in '61. The, the the play, the Living Theater, was from '59, I think, and then I think Shirley Clark made the film in '61. And so there's actually a film. They're making a film. You know, it's basically junkies and jazz musicians, mm -hmm. but basically there's a, there's a play within a play. But they're actually making a film about it, so it becomes even more kind of meta levels, which is similar to Symbio and to me and so. Well, that's so so very interesting that you mentioned Shirley Clark. Because um, Bill credits Shirley mm -hmm. with having made his independent career in New York City possible. Yeah. Um, she is the one who introduced his work to uh, George Stevens Jr., who was heading the motion picture uh, branch of the USIA. And they gave Bill his first opportunity to do an independently produced film when he came to New York. Um, he did uh, something <laughs> that he called a nation of dissenters, <laughs> which reminds me of today. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> the USIA changed it, the title, <laughs> to Wealth of a Nation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nation of Dissenter is a little bit too far gone, <laughs> too far out there. Um, but it had to do with ultimately not so much political, there was some of that, but artistic innovation mm. and dissent in the terms of the art world. There's some very interesting stuff in the film, and it's a very well, uh, well produced and well shot film. Um, but dated in terms of style today, it's an essay type film. Um, but that was the first film he made independently, and uh, it was due to Shirley, and they liked it. But they liked the film enough to give him some more film footage and send him off to Africa by cheapest route they could figure out. 
to cover um, five minutes of in black and white of this film festival that was was going on in uh, Sonegal, Dakar. Um, he decided that this was a, a project that was worth more than five minutes in the film magazine. Um, so he, he just hassled them to send him more footage, it, but it was all black and white. And that was cheaper at the time. Uh, but he, <laughs> he filmed this festival and, and it, it to me, I, it's one of my favorite films of, of his um, and became one of the most popular films in um, USIA history in terms of Africa anyway. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, that's a great Sorry, film. I've, seen, I've seen that film. I think you have seen it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, it, it's a beautiful yeah. film, by the way. He colored it sepia, but I think the sepia has, <laughs> has washed away. I don't know what happened to the sepia. We're now looking at black and white again. It's gone. Okay, I'm going to mention the, okay, um, I'm going to take a moment to mention the website. Okay. okay. So yes. probably a lot of you from watching Symbio have gotten materials, including the link to the website, but it's very easy to find. It's williamcraves.com. And it has there, it features 18 of his films. He's, he made, you know, 85 films, however many, but anyway, it features 18 of them. And that means that for all of those films, there's a page with a description, some commentary, a link to the trailer, um, some photographs, et cetera. And then there is a page called Purchase and Stream. And so all of those 18 films, you can stream VOD through Vimeo for nothing, for like $2.99, $3.99, whatever. And so in the case of um, uh, Still a Brother, uh, which is really an amazing film, that be it, we, we did this whole website last year during COVID, which meant that the original film materials are now all at the Schomburg and nobody could get to them. So it wasn't as if we could say, oh, let's pull the AB rolls from Still a Brother and remaster it, right? We didn't have that option. So the only option we had was to take the best possible transfer of it from whenever it was made and sort of fix it up a little bit and make it available. So they're, they're good enough to watch for sure. They're not going to be as good as, let's say, if you know Criterion takes on more of the works and remasters them. But you can still see Still a Brother, which you should see. And also, um, the First World Festival of Negro Arts is what Louise was just referring to, which is really beautiful. And it had been on YouTube. And as you know from YouTube, a lot of times people take work and put it up that isn't their own. And they put it up in the wrong format. So it's really stretched or it's really squished or whatever. And so the version that was on YouTube wasn't really correct. So now on the website, you can access the real version. And we did a tinting of it to approximate Bill's sepia. We couldn't, we didn't have a good copy to match it exactly, but you can see it in the, you know, the sepia feeling that he had intended. Plus, uh, a whole bunch of other really amazing films. So I encourage you to check out the website. And there's masses of material. Every review that's ever been written, every interview that's been done with him. I don't know. There's just so much stuff on there. So <laughs> thank you. So actually, um, about this thing, I want to make the way for Daniel to ask uh, to ask more. Um, well, I. I had one question to Sue indeed, and that relates to the website and to that wonderful work you did for it. Thank you so much for making it kind of available to other people to use and uh, your work really matters on that. My question was more about actual, since you, you as, a, as an artist like and, and filmmaker spent time researching, you know, this artist and, you know, devoted quite a lot of time in that kind of like a focused research. Did in some way, can you make some link between his work and your work as an artist or is there anything you learned specifically i don't mean like a comparing the two works more like a right like, are there any lessons that you can kind of dig like in your own work like that you 
by doing this with church, some, somehow you bump into something that really kind of open your eyes to, to your own work in, in some ways. Well, uh, first of all, I think a lot of the research was available through Louise, who worked with me the whole time on it. Every day I was on the phone like, Louise, when was that made? Where are the pictures? <laughs> so, so thank God Louise was working with me on it. Um, I, you know, I, um, I think uh, nobody's asked me that question before, and I haven't really thought of that question before because basically my relationship to his work is that um, because a lot of it wasn't available, I just wasn't aware of it. My first experience with his work was seeing Symbio. And it was seeing it back in 1991 when it was shown at the Flaherty, I think, or at the Brooklyn Museum. Brooklyn. And it was sort of like this revival of it that happened. And it completely blew my mind. I just sat there astonished at what I was seeing. And I walked away thinking, okay, I've never seen a film like that before. I don't know who this guy is, but he's made one of the best films I've ever seen. And I still think it's one of, it's my, one of my top five films. Um, so uh, it, it, in the sense that he was willing to do exactly what he wanted to do, you know, just completely follow his own uh, feelings and thoughts, um, maybe a little differently than when he was funded by, um, you know, USIA or, you know, these places that were sort of commissioning him. It seemed like he had absolute freedom to pursue what he was doing when he did Symbio. And I think, well, yeah, I mean, I kind of approach making my own work in that way. So he felt like a kindred spirit. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, I think, I don't know, his, his concern to tell the truth about what the human experience is in, in, in different ways in the different films, I guess is something I've tried to do in my work. Um, but I don't compare them that directly, you know, uh, with the way I work. Uh, but I must say that, you know, Symbio was one of the sort of watershed experiences in my life as a filmmaker, seeing that film, which is partly why I felt so compelled to do the, the website with Louise. Uh, Thank you so much for that. It was uh, so very, very wonderful that you did that. You pushed me in the back because I wasn't really enthusiastic about this. I felt I had my, my plate was full and the other website we had worked very hard on, but it, it was very dated. And now we'll see how this works. This is incredible. It's, I, everybody loves it. We, um, uh, Princeton, uh, we brought Symbio uh, take two and a half to Princeton uh, right when it was released. He was going off uh, with it to Sundance in Berlin and we sort of, you know, had a little screening at Princeton with it, which was really exciting. Um, and, um, but then uh, a year and a half ago or something, uh, two, some artists uh, created a symposium at Princeton about um, Greaves' work. And, um, and I was talking to Louise at it, and I said something about wanting to have the university buy in the company of men or, you know, one of the films for the collection. And she said, yeah, well, you know, you can find it on the website. And I went to the website and I called her up and I was like, Louise, it says it's available in VHS. And she was like, yeah, we've been meaning to update the website. And so that sort of started the conversation about updating the website, which of course, you know, it kind of exploded, um, but, uh, but I'm very, you know, I'm very happy to have his work more available through the website and all the, and also all his, his own writings, you know, again, there's this page and, you know, he's, he's written very interestingly about Symbio, but also about um, a number of the other films. And so all of that material is also there uh, for people. I, I, I really love the, um, how, Ahead of his time, I think he must have been when he wrote, um, I think it's 100 Madison Avenue. Oh, absolutely. Will not be enough. <laughs> right, right. Um, to, to change the fate of America and the world, if you will. Right. And it, he was thinking in terms of um, 
uh, the ecological damage that we were creating. And this was, what is it, 71, I think, 1971. But he's, he had a very broad vision of the future of humanity. And even though his, the, his, maybe his motivation for doing film came out of his realization that this information had, would, would make a difference that the, in terms of, of uh, the ma majority white at the time <laughs> uh, view of African-Americans that um, film could reach, that people were reachable through the art of film. So anything he made had to be up to a certain standard in terms of truth, in terms of pro proven reality, and also from an artistic and emotional point of perspe uh, perspective. Um, he realized people don't, cha don't change their ideas because they get new bits of information. They, they, they have an emotional thing. And he tried to, to reach them, us, humanity, through his art to move them from one stage of, of degree of consciousness to another. Um, and that was his, his real, real goal was always to raise awareness, to raise consciousness, not so much to inform, although that, that was an important part of it. Um, you know, Elsa, we were, we were working on this last year um, at the start of COVID. And so then it was like, oh, great, I've got a really complicated project to do it. That's going to take up my time and I'll forget about <laughs> the pandemic. And then George Floyd was killed. And so for months after he was murdered, we were still working on it because it didn't launch until September. And I, I felt like I started out working on it um, out of a real, uh, you know, admiration for his work and a feeling that the films were really important and, and being aware of the fact that of course they were made by an African-American and they, you know, most often touched on some part of the experience of being African-American. But after the George Floyd murder and then the Black Lives Matter protests all over the place, it was so much more intense for me because I thought, right, the kinds of things he's talking about in these films that were made 30 years ago, more however long, they're still here. They're, it's still a problem, right? And he was, uh, I wouldn't say he was visionary. He was saying, okay, this is how bad it is right now whenever he was making that particular film. But when you look at them now, you think, oh, okay. So he was saying that 35, 40 years ago and we're still facing almost the same degree of a problem with you know um, things in America. And so it was quite an amazing time to be working on it because of that. Um, and, and it also made me hope that you know, having having the work available would give people more of a sense of this history, you know, and, and people right now are making very important, um, you know, documentary exposés about racism in America, for sure. Um, so we have these contemporary works, but it's also important to ha have a sense of, or to know that works like his were made so long ago that are a, a part of this story, you know. Um. I think he was a bridge in a way from the pre-civil rights to through the civil rights era and beyond. And that, um, you know, he came out of Harlem. <laughs> Whenever people would ask him where he came from, he'd say, you're looking at a Harlem boy. <laughs> it doesn't matter how old he was, he's still a Harlem boy. <laughs> Um, but it, he, he was influenced by uh, the generation, the pre-civil rights generation, the Harlem Renaissance generation of people who were very conscious and who, <laughs> I would say, just poured information into his, his little child brain 
and soul and recognized in him someone who um, could continue this to uh, communicate and pass along the story that had yet to be told, really. Um, uh, it's an interesting, there's a very interesting uh, article, Sue, that you may not have seen because it just came out in a magazine, a new magazine that's being published by Black Star uh, Film Project, whatever it is, um, called Seen, S-E-E-N. <laughs> it's about Black film and the leading essay is about Bill. It's oh. called Speaking of Rivers and it harks back to um, the poet uh, uh, Langston Hughes and to the Harlem Renaissance and it's extremely beautifully done. It's, a, it's the most intimate look personal intimate look of, at Bill and the influences that, that he was exposed to mm -hmm. uh, that I've seen. Uh, it's by someone by the name of uh, John Cesare Goff. I have to get the link from you later. Mm -hmm. Beautifully done piece um, and beautifully illustrated. That sounds, that sounds amazing. Um, I have another question um, that somebody asked me to ask. Um, I just want to get it through before Sue needs to go, but I want to ask in advance, it, who wants to ask after this one? Just say your names, Anthony. I see Anthony. Okay, Anthony. So I, I was going to ask a question. So maybe just go, maybe just, just, just do it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, thank you both so much for being here. I just have a couple like historical questions. I'm curious is, so was he doing black journal at the same time <laughs> as Symbio? And I'm just curious about sort of the, I mean, I guess it's, I think so but I wasn't sure. And then I was just curious about the sort of balancing of those it, worlds. Well, that's a very interesting question because yes, from a, a calendar point of view, he had to right. have been already working, maybe perhaps not as the um, executive producer at that point, but certainly on camera as the co-host and um, yeah, it it happened almost simultaneously. The the um, Black Journal was a monthly program, it, it, and I keep reminding myself and others that this was the first. Although there were others that followed for locally locally uh, produced uh, shows by Black. For, for black consumption. But um, Black Journal was the first regularly nationally broadcast um, news magazine, if you will, show. It was not a, an interview show. It was, they actually created, usually in, in most cases, four separate little stories and filmed around the United States and, and even abroad. Um, so each one was a separate production. Um, and I've, I've been reading a little bit about the, you know, the impact of that show on, on the, the how shall I say this, the society at large. Apparently it was like a, a revelation to Americans to see black people talking about their own problems through seeing them through their own lens and trying to figure out where they were and what they were gonna do about it. Prior to that, they were just the subject of 
and maybe today they'll still to some degree. But the uh, subject of white, <laughs> which of the white uh, mainstream, it did dealt with their crime and with the poverty and all the problems, but uh, you didn't hear anything from the black people who were living their lives. So this was a completely different look at the reality. And a lot of, um, I have this down from Bill, he was getting a lot of response from the white community. We're fascinated to see, oh my goodness, look at this. <laughs> Amazing. Right, they walk, they talk. <laughs> it's the word discovery. The discovery was in process. Um, anyway, I could talk about Black Journal a lot. It's, it's an incredible experience. But Bill was, was working, yes, on other projects as he was doing the Black Journal too. <laughs> and he, I think he left his stamp on Black Journal. There was no one else there who could have taken over that position and who understood the whole situation as he did. He, was, he never spoke intellectually about his work, but he was an, he was an inter interesting intellectual thinker. He just had a grasp of what he read a lot. <laughs> He wrote a lot. He had a huge library. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with it. Thousands of books. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to ask one Thank more you. question um, uh, from somebody who sent it to me. And I believe with that, we'll wrap up. Sue, if you have to go. No, no, it's OK. It's fine. OK, wonderful. Um, yay. Here I go. Um, maybe I'm acting, maybe we're all acting. That's a quote from the film. The scene bearing notions of mutiny where the crew is taking about the director, uh, the crew is talking about the director hiding and sort of performing his act of psychoanalysis on Bill. Uh, reminds me of both Les Blank's Burdens of Dreams where he have where, where we have an narrator more or less reliable telling us the progression of the relationship and tension between everyone on the set, but also the opening night of John Casavetes in which we experience this blurred shift between reality and fiction through the eyes of Gina Rollins, who plays an actress married to a man played by Casavetes to whom she's in fact married in real life. So we know that Casavetta's wife is in a lot of his films. Um, and she's also absolutely fantastic. Um, Matt, what mechanism takes place when this trespass trespassing of reality takes place within the film, within the narrative, and it is at all any diff is, is it at all any different than the trespassing of reality that takes place in any art making? So that's, that's a mouthful, mm -hmm. but um uh let me know if you want me re to repeat any any part but basically i i um read from the question that there is uh sort of a uh Kasavet is here is brought as an example to somebody who was also experimenting um and this sort of what's real what's fiction kind of border that's not really firm. I think I'm going to leave that to Sue, but because I'm having trouble figuring this out. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Right now. Sue, do you? Want to turn well, I, I, I might not answer the question directly, but I do think uh, one of the things that I love so much about um, Symbio is the degree to which Bill was just playing with everybody, including almost including himself. Um, he was provoking the crew. You, you, you know, you. I think when you see the film for the first time, you're surprised at the the revolt of the crew, um, and their discussion is so fascinating um, because they're not sure whether they're being had or not. And um, you're not sure at that point whether he told them to do it or not. Um, 
And meanwhile, these poor actors are seemingly being, you know, coached by him and they're rehearsing this scene, which is supposed to be a serious scene. And you feel at moments that they are thinking, this just can't be real, you know, this can't possibly be what we're trying to do. Um, and and there's this one of my favorite moments is the film in the film is where he there's a sort of a wide shot and he goes walking away like over a little hill and there's some voiceover about it where he's just sort of like do I really know what I'm doing or somebody in the crew is saying he has no idea what he's doing and I just think it's so funny and and I I do think the comparison with Cassavetes is interesting um, and and I I, I think. You know, in part, we have to bear in mind when these films were made. I mean, it was, you know, the late 60s and everybody in every way was trying to think of what's possible beyond all of the strictures that, you know, they had been raised in and, you know, what's the right way to make a movie? What's the right way to write a book? What's the right way to make music? And people were breaking out all over the place. And, um, and, and I think this film has a lot to do with just what was going on then um, uh, to the to the extent that he had written this and he says you know the it's utterly banal the, you know the script that he wrote for them was he considered like the most horr horrifyingly banal thing um, but it's all about sex and you know homosexuality and all of that and um, and uh, um, and at one point, the, the the crew is like, ugh, you know, he can't even write a good script. I mean, this is 1968, you know, he should just speak more directly. So even though he was making something that was so radical, um, they were even seeing it as perhaps, you know, slightly reactive. younger from a different generation thinking like, ugh, this is so, you know, tired. Um, so I, 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 I just think this notion of, you know, what's acting, what's documentary, you know, yes, they're documenting a scene of somebody rehearsing actors, but there's so much subterfuge and um, acting going on in the documenting of the acting that I think it just becomes like a crazy knot of you know forever maybe forever to try to figure out and then also to not try to figure out maybe just say right this is what this is it's always gonna go like this as you watch it as you think about it there's no place to land um in the, in the sense that you can't say it's a documentary or it's whatever it might be you know i i think it, it you should it, one should let it just be endlessly sort of in conflict with itself and playing with itself. Um, it's interesting that there's no real place to land. There's no answer. It's quite, it's a lot, a lot of questions. Right. About, yeah. about reality and, and what is real and what isn't real and where, what are we doing here? <laughs> right. What's yeah. it all about? Um, why make films in a way, you know, what are films? I, maybe, I don't know if people uh, read, uh, Scott, uh, Scott McDonald did um, a long interview with him many years ago in one of his um, uh, critical cinema volumes. And he also included um, various uh, production notes from Bill and in it, and I'm gonna read from my notes uh, cause I always forget how to say this, but Bill said that it was based on two things. And here I go with my glasses. One was the second law of thermodynamics, which mm -hmm. is that energy is constantly transferred and it cannot be destroyed. Um, and so in a sense, the flow between the camera and the crew and the actors and the audience, just, you know, constant, you know, the energy is just always mm -hmm. going around and it, and it cannot be destroyed. And the other was the Heisenberg um, uncertainty principle which is that you can't know reality because the electron microscope bombards, bombards and alters what it's looking at. And so the camera is kind of like that. So, you know, he, as you say, Louise, he was very smart and he read a lot. And I think, he, you know, making this seemingly wacky film <laughs> out of these two very serious principles from physics is something I really love about it. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. I have um, part of it. Yes, he was fascinated with um, with science, 
And, you know, intention, he had intended to take uh, engineering to become a, a civil engineer, um, but he was drawn into the, uh, the arts. And he says that as a child, he, he was very self-directed. He spent hours drawing that was his fun thing to do. In fact, he won um, a scholarship as a child to one of the <laughs> one of the seventy five best child uh, artists in New York <laughs> State, <laughs> <laughs> and it involved um, a Saturday morning class in art at the Little Red Schoolhouse. So this was a big thing for Bill out of Harlem. He's, he's, he's on Saturday morning because he could go to the, school, the little red schoolhouse in the village <laughs> and get this wonderful experience. And his, his, his other very powerful influence was the um, Stuyvesant High School. He was highly competitive and he, he didn't want anybody to be getting better grades than he did. <laughs> and he kept saying, there was one kid, <laughs> Arthur Greenberg or somebody, who just kept getting better grades and he was driving Bill crazy. <laughs> he, but he was way up there and very competitive. He, he and you know, the family was poor as church mice. Uh, they had nothing. He had to go and there was no allowance for the week for the kids, there were seven of them. So he had to go and earn a living and he shined shoes and he delivered papers and he worked in the garment industry, he worked at the post office. Um, he was Oh, oh, and he went, he took his, he bought his teachers, um, one of his teachers would give him money every day to go get his lunch. And Bill would run to the store, get the lunch, and he'd be able to keep the change. <laughs> that was, you know, his experience with finances. <laughs> anyway, this was, um, this was a kid who just was determined determined and excited, excited about world. He loved going, he said, <laughs> to the bookstores. There were, there were a lot of black bookstores at the time. And that was where he lost. And he did his homework at the Schomburg Center, <laughs> where the librarians would just feed him stuff. So he had a very close relationship. He lived next door to the Schomburg. <laughs> it's on the same block anyway. So um, he had a very interesting per experience growing up. And I don't think we fully mm -hmm. recognize how wonderful it was. He did. He was very excited about his childhood. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's such a beautiful, um, beautiful thing to know about a person. Mm -hmm. uh, friends, I have promised to finish at a certain time and we are already late. Um, I am so grateful for both of you for coming. It's an incredible honor and just so much fun. And everybody else who came, I am so happy that you all made it. And we have a little ritual we finish with, which is everybody turns their camera on and we're clapping. So... I think it's time for us to do that. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Can I clap too? Of, co <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so Thank glad. Thank you both. I'm so glad. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Thank we you could both. go on and on uh, forever. I, it's, it, was, it was very exciting. I, I could speak forever about Bill. It's hard for me to stop. <laughs> That's my problem. <laughs> stop. Well, thankfully, there are a lot of people who want to live just want to listen to things about Will, so.